Okay, now I want to go through some best practices uh, when running watershed analysis tools or hydrology tools. Um, number one, you're going to create this unified set of outputs. You're going to have your, your DEM, a filled version of your DEM, a flow direction created from your filled DEM, a flow accumulation raster calculated from your filled DEM, and probably a hillshade so you have a really great base map to underlay as you're looking at these things. So you can track where your, where your uh, drainage divides are. So I would highly recommend working with this naming convention where you simplify the name of your DEM. Mine was called SALT in the previous video. That was um, my quick abbreviation for Big Cottonwood Canyon in Salt Lake City. So I had SALT fill, SALT underscore, flow direction underscore, flow accumulation, hillshade. You could go on and on. Slope, uh, curvature, all of the, the uh, surfaces that you're going to derive from this one DEM can all be... Um, have these file extensions basically put on with them. Um, warnings about raster naming. They, the names can't exceed 13 characters. You can't have any spaces and don't start them with numbers. Um, you'll get the 999999 error um, and no further help um, when you're trying to run tools. If the output has a space, if the path has a space, um, or if there's a number at the beginning of the file. So just be careful with that. Um, for your submission, um, you can download polygons. You can download watershed boundaries. It, it might be interesting for you um, to compare a polygon version of your watershed with what you delineate. So if you pick a pore point that is near um, the polygon you know, um, outlet, basically, for your watershed area, you might, um, yeah, it might be interesting for you to see how it differs what somebody else has mapped versus what your DEM is creating. So this is an image here. The, the black line is the mouth of a watershed. Um, the green is the raster calculation, the delineation that was done using this red uh, pore point. And then the orange lines were just manually drawn to show the differences, um, just in close up. Just, just a thought. Um, part of this exercise is to calculate stream order. And, um, you know, I just thought we'd talk about this really quick for those of you who don't have a hydrology background. Stream orders describe um, basically um, not the strength of the stream, but it has to do with how many streams are coming together to create um, larger um, channels. Boy, that was inarticulate. First order streams are head headwater streams. And when two first order streams come together, the resulting channel is a second order stream. A second order plus a first order is still a second order. To get a third order stream, you have to have two second order streams coming together. So you can see here a first order is coming into a third, it remains a third. In order to get a fourth order stream, you have to have two third order streams coming together. So why, are, why am I talking about this nonsense? Well, it's really helpful in describing the drainage density of a watershed. So if you're doing a big landscape comparison, whether it has to do with wildfire and sediment routing or um, just describing characteristics of a landscape, um, whether you're getting at fish habitat, um, it's an incredible terrain of, uh, variable to be able to calculate and then compare across watersheds. It does, um, it does correlate with habitat variability, uh, terrain variability, um, roughness, steepness, um, and then the overall drainage density of a, of a watershed. So it's a handy thing to know how to calculate. So you're going to be working on that. Um, it is um, something that you should spend a little bit of time um, symbolizing beautifully. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a flow accumulation layer, and we talked about that a little bit in the last video, but it's it's basically an artificial stream network, and then you're going to um, convert it to um, polygons, and you'll have a calculation for stream order, and you'll be able to use the stream order to assign symbology that will hopefully increase in color or width as the stream order number increases. Okay, so um, one thing to think about is with the flow accumulation line, this is a stretched color ramp, right? And we're able to see 
um, black against white because there's probably, you know, 14 cells draining into any one area just off this channel, but this has the entire upstream drainage basin coming into it, so the numbers are really high. What we want to do is come up with two classes. We want to classify this flow accumulation to create this visual proxy for a stream network. Um, the idea is what value represents stream? How many cells upstream from you would it require to create a headwater? That's kind of what I want you to, to play with a little bit. And you're going to do that um, by using the symbology. Um, so you're not, you know, running the reclassify tool or anything like that yet. What I want you to do is go in and create two classes for this flow accumulation raster and then break it um, at different values. So in this example on the right, um, I broke it at 100,000. So anything less than, any cell that has less than 100,000 cells draining into it is not stream. And any cell with more than 100,000 cells draining into it is going to be called a stream. And you can see here that we've got the main channel um, through the canyon and like a little tributary coming in here. So that number is probably um, too big. Let's dial it back a little bit. And here I broke it at 10,000. So I'm basically saying any cell with less than 10,000 cells draining into it is not stream, but anything above 10,000 cells is now going to be a stream. So I, I brought that number down. And now you can see that I've got lots of tributaries coming in and even tributaries on tributaries. So that's maybe a little bit more realistic. So how can you evaluate um, what a good number is? And you may want to, A, look at the base map and look to see you know, what kind of mapping was done there. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but there's um, light blue lines under here that come up um, into the headwaters of these canyons, like all the way up here. You might not be able to get it to match. You might not be able to get it to match exactly, um, but use that as a guide. You could also download the NHD um, 1 to 24,000 scale streamline from uh, the USGS and use that as a comparison. There are certainly, you know, resources out there. I'm sure ArcGIS Online has some um, base maps you could pull in as well. So what you might want to do is make a comparison and summarize places where your stream network falls short. Um, where, where do you create streams where a stream probably doesn't really exist. Um, justify your threshold value and discuss what that means in your write-up. All right, let's talk about some cartography. Okay, these are just some random, um, random things that I kind of wanted to talk about. When you're making side-by-side -side comparisons um, and you have multiple, um, multiple maps in one layout, um, I think it's a better rule of thumb or a better best practice to just have one scale bar for all of the maps instead of a scale bar like this that spans them all. We aren't measuring three miles across here because, you know, each map is only uh, around, I mean, not even a mile wide, but something like that. So, oh yeah, I guess it is about a mile wide. So we aren't measuring this space and this isn't, you know, from here to here isn't one and a half miles, right? It's like a mile and then the same mile. So I would avoid spanning um, map frames like this with a scale bar. Just my two cents. Um, what else? Representative fractions. The idea that one inch on the map equals 3,500 inches on the ground. This is, I think, makes for an interesting setup this way. But with digital maps, it's rarely going to be true. OK, so if I just resize this, oh, well, that was a crazy resize. But uh, it's not true any longer. Um, and if I were to project it on a screen, it's not true any longer. If you were looking at it in a big desktop monitor, it's not true any longer. 
So the, the proportion between them is probably going to be the same, but I would argue that this is always going to be a more effective way of showing that change. You know, making the comparison mathematically between these two numbers is no easier than making this comparison. And no matter what size I see this at, it's always going to be true because the scale scales with the changing size of the map, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so that's my two cents on representative fractions. They're really old fashioned. They only work if you print the map at the size it was set up at in ArcPro or ArcMap. Okay, slope. If you're making a map to demonstrate something like slope or curvature or something like that, you can show it like this. This is just the flat result. Um, it was uh, has a display mask on it, so it's kind of cut out at the watershed boundary. But what if you just made it semi-transparent, displayed it over the hillshade? To me, it's a lot more professional looking. Um, it does change the colors a little bit, but if you keep your hillshade black to white, um, I think it, I think it gives um, the data more punch and makes it more informational. Um, another thing to think about with slope, ArcMap in particular loves giving you your slope um, in a classified setup like this. There's no reason it has to be classified. So you can just go into the symbology and change it back to a stretched color ramp, and then you don't have the slope in classes. So it's just something to think about. Uh, and that's it, my two cents on cartographic nuances.